All right. Uh, so welcome back, and we are uh, learning about the Ministry of Intercession. So so far, what have you picked up from our discussions about the Ministry of Intercession? Yes. So can we simply say that Ministry of Intercession is important? Yes, it is important. What else did we understand? OK. Yeah, this is a selfless ministry. We won't compare, because every ministry is rewarding in its own way. But definitely, this is also a very rewarding ministry. We are satisfied. Yes. OK. Great. So uh, ministry is service. And for us to be complete and perfect simply means to have the character of Christ and the power of Christ. OK, great. So that's also something we understood. What else? Anything else about intercessory? There's no boundaries. There's no distance. OK, we are like prayer warriors. Yeah, that word makes sense now, because there is a struggle and a fight spiritually involved. OK, that, that makes sense. Yes, so it's not a burden, but we do it with zeal and passion. Um, so here again, uh, someone uh, Justin says, powerful as any other ministry. Yes, good. We have some, uh, you know, good understanding developing about the Ministry of Intercession. Yes. Yeah. So we should do it uh, fervently, like Epaphras. So we engage um, in a consistent determined way uh, it's then that we see the results and you know we were saying there's no distance involved we saw that there are two places close to Colosse uh, like you know certain miles away and uh, Epaphras still prayed for them but when Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians Paul was actually in Rome so it is said that um, he was some 2500 kilometers from Rome. So you can imagine uh, Epaphras is praying for Colosse from Rome, 2,500 kilometers. So it doesn't matter. Distance is never an issue as far as prayer is concerned. That's why, you know, even when you get some messages you hear, or oh, someone's not well, or they are in this difficulty, immediately you can just pray because your prayer will touch them. OK, so uh, in that sense, it's a very beautiful ministry. And uh, yeah, a few more things about this ministry is um, whenever we think about praying and interceding, uh, as I began earlier, this is more like a secret place ministry. It's not so much of a pulpit or uh, you know, in front of people kind of a ministry. Uh, you remember what Jesus said when uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 um, and, and 6. You know, when you're reading those pass passages, there in Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6, he says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to the to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So, intercession, even prayer for that matter, yes, sometimes it is public. Sometimes you know, like we we have our um, uh, small group prayer, or we have here Bible college prayer, supernatural hour, so many community prayer uh, you know, programs where we pray in front of people. But that will just be the tip of the iceberg. The rest of our prayer life is all secret place. It's all secret place because personally, we are spending time in the presence of God, which nobody knows about and you know, which nobody will, um, uh, you know, they and it should be like that also. There's no need to go and make it public 
and and say oh do you know i pray like this and i this is how how much of time i am spending with the lord maybe sometimes just to teach and inspire others we may share oh like this i my this is what my routine is but beyond that most of prayer and intercession is very much a secret place kind of a ministry and that's what jesus said he said look at the the you know pharisees the hypocrites what do they do they pray in public places so that they can get recognition through prayer but you go into your room and when you have shut your door meaning it's personal okay it's personal you don't want to publicize it when you have shut your door pray to your father who is in the secret place so even god you know uh, reaches out to us in that personal place of prayer uh, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly so this practice of intercession in the secret will bring reward openly so you know many times we we read about uh, again going back to the revivals you know when you study about all these people who experienced revivals in their churches in their cities uh, you will notice that most of them had a very powerful prayer life and uh, it was not just prayer in front of the people like uh, there is one person um, William J Seymour this is 1905 Azusa street revival when you study about that revival you see that he had learned somewhere about prayer and uh, he started like dedicating himself to god for prayer and he he set aside time in his personal life to pray and he was increasing like he started one hour and then two hours three hours something like that five hours and i think at one point he was praying seven hours in a day uh and when he you know began his his ministry revival broke out and a lot of miraculous things took place in his ministry and uh, you can read many writings about the azusa street revival but one of the key things that people say about the leader william j seymour is he was a man of prayer he would not even speak a word till he felt led by the holy spirit and all the time um uh, you know he would be behind the pulpit even behind the pulpit he would be praying 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 okay so uh, the point i'm making is sometimes we only talk about the results which is open which is visible which is evident but uh, the results usually come after somebody has devoted this kind of a uh, personal uh, you know secret time in prayer okay which they may not talk about but it's understood even in the life of jesus you know so many miracles all one step you know stretch forth your hand the lepers you know, leprosy got healed or uh, you know um, come out any demonic spirit the spirit came out but you also read about the intimate life of jesus with the father he spent hours and hours he took time away you know he he went uh, to a mountain and he just spent time with with the father what is all that secret place intercession okay so where is all this power coming from unless one has that secret place you know personal time in prayer we cannot expect you know that that uh, anointing in the ministry that we do so it's so important now we will also understand you know when we talked about prayer we said uh, actually it's difficult like especially when you are in ministry okay whatever little experience i have i can tell you the more ministry you have you become more busy and everything has a lot of responsibility right so if i have to teach a class then i have to prepare so much or you know i have to study so much that takes up time and so many other things take up time end of the day you're exhausted you're tired you can't even like you know uh, you don't even have the energy to spend time in prayer sometimes you say oh forget it i'll just do it tomorrow but you know what i have learned in my own life that i i can uh, you know subtract something else from my life which is so called interesting but not skip prayer because it is that important if i don't have the like the secret place you know time with the lord uh, all this public ministry it will not carry if you want to say the anointing or making an impact in people's lives uh, unless you have prayed 
through right uh, what is god saying here when the father sees you in the secret will reward you openly so for that openly experience we need the secret place experience okay so it's it's a journey for each of us it's a journey it's a struggle um so uh, even as time goes by as life goes by let me tell all of you you know the kind of time you have today don't expect it to you know uh, later in fact you're in a really good place because so many things are taken care of but as life goes on you know you have to take care of work bills cooking cleaning everything right so your time is going your energy is going and you still have to make time for prayer so we have to still fight for it that time with the lord in secret so when we have that time in the secret place that's when you know this passage says openly you will see the results or the reward of the father so this is the kind of intercessory ministry that you know one um, uh, needs to develop where most of our time is in private you know in a um, sort of a personal hidden setting it's not in a public setting but you see the results in the public setting so uh, especially you know when you get involved in ministry and all never replace you know time in the ministry sometimes what people do is they say oh anyway i am praying in the public like in the group prayer we are having church prayer we are having it's okay i don't have to spend time personal prayer no you cannot replace the two are very different okay so personal prayer is very very important um not just that even personal bible study sometimes we say oh yeah i started these notes to teach in the class it's okay it's word of god only you know no no this is different from uh, you know the the quiet time that i need to have for my own personal spiritual growth you cannot replace or you cannot mix the two so all this is very important very very important uh, and, and you know we have to get a grip so as far as ministry and prayer is concerned it's more of a secret place uh, you know kind of a, a situation by that we don't mean you have to find the secret place it just means it's not public you do it you know uh, behind the scenes okay so that is, is something we have to understand then you know few more things um, that we we recognize about uh, intercessory ministry is that there are passages in the bible in psalms and revelation where we learn that the prayer which we pray it is like incense incense so all of us from the indian setting we understand what is incense right people uh, use incense before their gods and goddesses you can see the uh, yeah the smoke yeah so the smoke it just goes up in in front so in the same way psalm 141 verse 2 it says let my prayer be set before you as incense so it, you can just picture we are not saying that prayer is incense it's a comparison so when we pray it's almost like in the presence of god our prayer is going like a smoke you can imagine right you can imagine so it, go, it goes into the presence of god the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice again revelation 5 8 it says now when he had taken the scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints so the in heaven you know you can picture the scene in the presence of god there are these bowls which are taken with incense what are these bowls and what is the incense in it the explanation is right there for us to interpret it says which are the prayers of the saints so our prayers you can imagine it lick this way also it's incense in a bowl it is kept in the presence of god it is kept in the presence of god so the encouragement which we have is when we pray directly my prayers and your prayers okay the prayers of believers it's directly entering the presence of god do we need 
somebody to push our prayer into the throne room of God? No. Sometimes we have all these concepts, right? That no, this man of God should pray, or this saint should pray, or somebody else should pray. Then only it will go directly in God's presence. But do you see here? The prayers of the saints, which is your prayer and my prayer, your prayers are entering, piercing heaven, and they are before God, direct. Okay, So that's such an encouragement. So when we intercede, you can think of all these things. Wow, right now, as I pray, my prayers are piercing into heaven. And it's like incense before the Lord. So incense is worship. Okay, when you look at the tabernacle, the old tabernacle uh, architecture, which God gave Moses, he told him, have incense. Why incense? It was a worship practice. So when we pray, it's like worship before the Lord is going up. It's beautiful in God's presence. So we think of all these things and it energizes us to engage in prayer, to engage in intercession. So, you know, we can um, continue to minister and, uh, you know, offer our time, offer our energy, our effort to pray. Okay. And also to pray for others. That is what ministry is serve others through our prayer. So, a few things which we would say is um, when we pray for others, and also if we have uh, a ministry of prayer. Here are some guidelines. Keep this in mind. One is to not, you know, promote ourselves for our prayer ministry. Sometimes it happens, you know, that uh, we end up uh, saying, no, but I'm praying. I'm praying for everything. We want to say, oh, whoever won the elections, you know, I prayed. We, we like to promote ourselves and say, I'm doing my my praying successfully, efficiently, or God is answering because of my prayer. So there's a tendency to, you know, promote oneself and our prayer ministry. But actually speaking, it should be a very quiet thing because that's what we see here. You go to the secret place, you pray to the Father, the Father who hears you in the secret will reward you openly. So trying to promote oneself and our ministry of intercession should not be, you know, a practice. Okay. For that matter, any ministry, we read about this, I think in your code of honor, you will, you will study uh, this particular point where we say, we don't really have to promote ourselves. You know, if there is, if there is a ministry for which God has called us, if there's an anointing in that ministry, God will make the way. He will open the doors. You know, we don't have to um, get people's attention to make things work. So uh, just keep it before the Lord and He will open the doors. Yeah. Uh, here too in Matthew 6, verse 2, he says that uh, he talks about uh, teaching about charity. So when you give something to a person, not make a big show of it as the hypocrites do in the house of worship around the streets. They do it so that people praise them. I assure you, they've already been paid in full. So we can take that example in prayer, for prayer also. Yeah, yeah. In everything. Yeah. yeah. So whatever ministry we do, basically don't make a big show uh, about it. That's the point we learn. So especially in prayer ministry, uh, not to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, there are some points which are mentioned here that, again, bragging about know oneself as an intercessor because these are all things that tend to happen um, and uh, so we avoid it. it it's more like a service which is done in humility all right uh, and when we are praying for others you know god is so good that uh, when you are praying for yourself you reap blessings out of it but even when you're praying for others the Bible says that God extends his blessings on those who pray for others. Okay, So uh, God still adds to our blessings when we are ministering to others. So there is a scripture in the book of Job, Job 42 and verse 10, where you know Job, he prays for his friends 
and uh, we know that his friends were not um, encouraging people or they were not you know empathetic supportive people but still job prays for his friends so job 42 and verse 10 and the lord restored job's losses when he prayed for his friends indeed the lord gave job twice as much as he had before so when he prays for others his life is affected positively so here is another reason why you and i can be encouraged when we pray for others god will bless us also okay so there is a blessing connected to praying for others um i think we have touched on most of the points or nearly all the points here in our notes if you have any additional comments thoughts uh, we can talk about it and then we jump to the next topic here okay some uh, comments here in the chat mm, uh, jashin says it may not be seen or applauded by others but passionate prayer warriors um, in is kingdom service known to the lord fully what we do okay great uh, and prabhu says prayer is pleasing to god all right yeah so um, prayer intercession it's done before the lord recognized and applauded by god okay any other questions about the ministry of intercession ministry of intercession Okay. Mm, people who travail, is it? People who travail. Uh, I think Paul, he already wrote about it. I labor for... Uh, mm, mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we saw that uh, passage where Jesus, before the um, resurrection of Lazarus, there is one place where Jesus, it, it says like he travailed before the tomb. So that is one example. And someone pointed out, uh, would it be possible um, to say that you know, people like Hannah would have travailed? I believe yes, because that was a personal prayer request. But she, she labored in prayer. You can see that when she's going and crying and praying. It's an earnest prayer, but I think there must have been an element of travail which was involved in that. No, even personal prayers and you know receiving answers to personal prayers uh, is something that God is happy about. Uh, example, Abraham. So in the kingdom of God, even when you see the fulfillment of a personal promise, it is beneficial for the whole kingdom. So God is happy about that. So you can labor even for personal things. Yeah. Okay, so... Yeah, so uh, there's a comment here, Jashin, he says, um, Epaphras prayed to the Lord for God's people. Um, are we called to pray for specific people to rise up for God fervently doing his will? Or is this common prayer for all people of God? Okay, good. Very nice question, uh, Jashin. So who do we pray for? Uh, we can understand that one must labor in prayer, but who do we pray for? Should we just pray general prayers or should it be more specific? So the answer to that is, you know, we would, we would um, you know, wait on the Lord to receive. We generally use the word burden. 
burden to receive a burden from god uh, to pray for you may start out in a general way but you will receive a burden or an uh, a prompting from god to go more specific on it okay so at that point you can shift from general prayers to a more specific prayer so uh, when i told you last time about uh, john hyde i think i mentioned no john hyde uh, cial court revival india so he was a foreigner who came to india but his heart was for india so like that you read about many uh, you know many people in the word of god who went to other nations they carried a burden for that particular nation like uh, you read about uh, what is that uh, inland china mission uh, hudson taylor he went to china okay william carey he came to india so then you wonder hey how can these people who have um, uh, uh, who are from another country come to you know some other nation Read about Amy Carmichael. She came to South of India and she set up hmm? Graham Stains. Okay, Graham Stains. So the it depends on the burden that God gives you. Maybe some of you here are pastors, okay, by calling, and you might have a burden for a place specifically. Like you might have a, pl a place like okay, um, South of. I'm just saying, you know, South of Calcutta. Or something like that. So in the heart, it's burning. You're only thinking about South of Calcutta. Why people are not there everywhere else or what? They are there, but somehow there is a burden in my heart for that place. So then if I know that I have the prompting, I have to pray in line with that prompting. It works like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes, Anand, that's what I'm saying. Like Epaphras, what is his ministry? Prayer ministry. So there is a particular calling. Some people will be intercessors. Yeah, we generally don't see many, maybe because many of them are praying quietly also. So we don't know. Yes. Hmm. Okay, okay. So Sean's question is instead of calling, okay, calling into a, a particular ministry or an office, like when you read Ephesians chapter four, you have the fivefold ministry offices: apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, pastor. So there are five. So you're asking instead of being called into one of these, um, uh, or some other, you know, grace. Uh, like maybe a teaching gift or a um, praying gift or something. Is it possible that one grows into it? Right. Okay. So actually, these are two different things, uh, Sean. One is maturing in God. Okay. Maturing in God, um, it's a journey which every believer needs to make. The other thing is calling. Now, callings differ for each individual. Um, and uh, everyone must fulfill their calling in God. Now, not all are called into fivefold ministry offices or even certain ministries that you know we are discussing right here. But whatever the call for their life, they need to fulfill. Uh, so, you know, these are not uh, actually interchangeable. So, all have to mature. Also, all have to identify their call and. Fulfill it also. Now, here is the, the thing though. For some people, from the beginning, they can know their call. For example, like, you know, um, Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. So when he encounters God, you later have Ananias. He comes and he prays for Saul when he, is, he cannot see. But God reveals to Ananias, this man, you know he's supposed to like he's an apostle to the uh, he, he uh, to the gentiles and he will stand before kings so calling is revealed when 
Paul is not even able to see. He has not even started his ministry for Christ. But beginning itself, he knows John the Baptist, you know, Zach uh, Zacharias. He is there in the temple, and uh, it's revealed to him. You, know, you shall call his name John, this and that. And uh, Zacharias comes. He prophesies over his newborn. In the beginning itself, so many things he says about John the Baptist. So, call is there on everyone's life. Somebody, some people know it from the beginning. Some people figure it out as the journey of life takes place. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. Yeah. Yeah, because, see, we usually use the word grace. Grace means God's empowering. So if God calls somebody for something, there will be the empowering of God. If I don't have the grace to, I'm just saying, you know, to lead worship, I can try all my life. It won't work. I'm just trying to move into an area where I don't have the gift. So important thing is all of us must discern where is my gift? You know, where is you know the place where God has strengthened me? When you start moving in that direction, you will see fruit. Yeah. So mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah, no, I have also heard all these, uh, you know, stories where people say that uh, uh, there was a need for somebody to do the ministry. So uh, nobody was available. So God picked so and so who was willing, who was willing. I agree with that. But I'm sure the person who was willing, you know, who had the burden to respond, also had certain graces in their life, uh, which made it possible for them to serve. Okay, so see, one can be willing, but if you don't have the grace, no, it's not going to work out. It won't work out. Okay, it's a very controversial question. Okay, so the question is that, uh, you know, sometimes families, uh, they tend to push uh, the children to continue the, the ministry work, even if they seemingly don't have the call of God. So what I said earlier stands true for this also. If there is no calling, if there is no grace, it will not work out. Okay, so uh, it's best not to force people like only if they have the call will they be able to take the work forward otherwise it's best to have a person who has the call even if they're not part of the family you understand so i think you will study about this in in uh, code of honor uh, house of god there are many subjects in which we talk about this so yeah Yes. Okay. See, the first part is uh, you, you said we, sh we should pray for a specific place. Hmm. Okay. When do we know when to stop praying? So, um, 
the scripture which we learned earlier okay this is romans 8 16 it says the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of god so so with this we understand that the holy spirit you know he has a way of letting our spirit know something in this case the Holy Spirit lets us know that we are the sons of God. So when we come in the presence of God, we are worshipping. You know, we might have all these doubts. No, you are a sinner. You didn't pray now, this and that. But what is Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit? You know, we are aware that God is saying, I am his son. I am his daughter. So I am just going to worship. These are all doubts. I am removing them from my mind. So there is a witness to your spirit. You go with that witness. In the first place, you know, when we say that I have a burden for this place, how did you know you have a burden? Because Holy Spirit gave witness to my spirit that this is the place you should pray for. In the same way, when do I stop praying? Holy Spirit will give witness to my spirit and say, okay, you've prayed like this, now you switch to this or something else. Okay, so you should you will be able to discern you will be able to discern wouldn't it be a waste of time if you prayed for a person and So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, praying as led by the Holy Spirit is never a wasted time. Okay, it's never a wasted time. Now, some prayers give you the results which you have prayed for, some don't. Okay, whether it is salvation or sometimes even healing, we pray, 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 pray. That person actually didn't get healed. Okay, it, these things happen. There are many reasons why, you know, that may not have taken place. Okay. But was it a waste of time that, you know, I prayed for this to happen? No. So many years I prayed. There's no use. No, I don't think so. I think when we are obedient to the leading of God, God takes notice of it. Now, even if you don't get the result, in the process of prayer, many things take place okay these are all spiritual things so we we can't you know uh, explain it or give you evidence all this has happened but it has happened by faith we believe that these things have happened so many things have happened but that specific result didn't come forth uh, i would say that's okay at least you obeyed and you prayed so it's it's useful yeah okay so um yeah even if we don't see answers i think the fact that we engaged in prayer is more important so good we have uh, spent a lot of time here um, as far as the ministry of intercession is concerned and so you know just trust god i think all of you would have heard of uh, ministries like international house of prayer you've heard kansas city uh, so they have prayer rooms that run 24 bar 7 and some of those prayers they even live stream so even if you're here in India, you can actually connect and you can be part of the intercessory and you know prayer ministry. So uh, around the world, around the world, uh, as we see, you know, days go closer to the return of Christ, we are going to see, you know, intercession increasing, okay, in various communities, worship. When you study about worship, 
even in that you you would uh, learn about all these things that it's it is going on it is increasing okay these movements prayer movement worship movement it will go to another level okay because that's what god is doing he's pouring out his spirit here uh, upon the earth so we just have to be open and uh, you know receive that burden so to speak you know for prayer uh, and it it will be a blessing it will be a blessing to us it will be a blessing to others so let's move on the next chapter here is uh, about praying for our family okay so we talked about intercession and the ministry of intercession now we are coming to pray for the family so there is a passage here from 1 Corinthians chapter 7 uh, verses 10 through 16 and the version given in our notes is the message version so um, yeah would somebody like to read it quickly but you'll have to use the mic page 58 and if you are married stay married this is the master's command not mine if a wife should leave her husband she must either remain single or else come back and make things right with him and a husband has no right to get rid of his wife for the rest of you who are in mixed marriages christian married to non christian we have no explicit command from the master so this is what you must do if you are a man with a wife who is not explicit command sorry who is not a believer but who still wants to live with with you hold on to her if you are a woman with a husband who is not a believer but he wants to live with you hold on to him the unbelieving husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife and the unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband otherwise your children would be left out as it is they also are included in the spiritual purposes of god on the other hand if the unbelieving spouse walks out you have got to let him on her go you don't have to hold on desperately god has called us to make the best of it as peacefully as we can you never know wife the way you handle this might bring your husband not only back to you but to god you never know husband the way you handle this might bring your wife not only back to you but to god yeah thank you thank you for uh, reading this passage so verse 14 here it says the unbelieving husband shares to an extent in the holiness of his wife and the unbelieving unbelieving wife is likewise touched by the holiness of her husband otherwise your children would be left out as it is they also are included in the spiritual purposes of god so there is a point which we are trying to make from this passage okay and that point is even in the case of a mixed marriage okay like uh, an unbeliever is married to a believer what paul is saying is the believer has spiritual influence on the unbelieving spouse and the unbelieving children okay maybe the children are unbelieving initially and they start believing but children who are a product of the mixed marriage what does it say it says they are included in the spiritual purposes of god okay so the point is in a family in a family when one is a believer in this case let's say a husband is a believer or a wife is a believer others are not okay the other spouse is not children are also not the believing person has a spiritual influence on the unbelieving spouse and the children okay do you do you get what i'm trying to say it's quite clear isn't it okay so the point the simple point is in a family even in a situation where there is only one believing spouse there is spiritual influence you can imagine about the spiritual influence if two people are believers isn't it husband wife both are believers will there be a spiritual influence which they have on each other on the children 
upon the family, yes or no? Yes, there will definitely be a stronger spiritual influence. So, see, based on the family relationships, what God does is he gives us spiritual influence. That means to say that there are certain prayers which family members can pray, uh, which outsiders cannot pray. See, somebody from outside, they may come and they may pray, okay, but they will not have that spiritual influence which we are talking about here. God has given a special spiritual influence, you know, between husbands and wives, between parents and children, okay, maybe even between siblings. We could say that. So we have to exercise that spiritual influence. And how can we, how will we do it? Through prayer. When we pray, something you know is accomplished when a family member prays for a family member all right uh, now just because this passage is there and we understood oh yeah there is some spiritual influence even if you marry an unbeliever please don't even consider that point okay because the bible is very clear that we should not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever because uh, it's not just about you know belief system and all but Spiritually, there are many implications, you know, when a, a believer is married to an unbeliever. It's it's a very um, crazy thing to do. Okay, So the Bible never recommends for a believer to marry an unbeliever. That's clear cut. That is established. Now, for our sake of understanding spiritual influence, we went to this passage. Okay, So uh, as we look at the rest of this uh, chapter, uh, now that we've understood there is a spiritual influence, there are certain points, you know, which we take and pray for our family members. So they're all listed here. Uh, so in praying for a spouse, you know, how can uh, one do that? So here is uh, the husband's prayer, prayer points, which are listed. So, you know, a husband could pray for the spiritual growth of his wife. Okay, so they could pray that, you know, um, that the wife... Um, know the truth of God's word. You know, there are some passages of the Bible here, um, which we, maybe I'll, I'll just read these passages and explain the prayer points next week, because we have only three minutes. I don't want to rush. Okay, so we will stop here. If there are any questions, let's take it up. Otherwise, we will pray and we will close the class. Yes, Anand. Okay, see, so uh, in the scenario which Paul writes, basically what he's saying is, see, it is like maybe two people who got married, both were unbelievers. Along the journey, one of them has become a believer. So in that situation, he's saying, um, if the unbelieving spouse wants to continue to stay with you, it's okay. That is the context. Now, if the unbelieving spouse says, okay, I'm going, you can't do anything about it. You let them go. That, that's the context. Now, I don't think in this situation, how can you call it a sin? Because both were unbelievers and, you know, one suddenly accepted Christ. Yeah, in another context, if somebody chooses to marry an unbeliever, right? Mm, see, first of all, I don't think the Spirit of God will lead you to marry an unbeliever. For sure, 100%. So that means we are going in a different direction. Right. So I don't know what. Yeah, yeah, possible. Sometimes there's pressure and, you know, other issues. Uh, see, one good thing is our God is a redeemer, restorer. Okay. So even if that decision is made, I think one should not um, sulk and say, oh, it's a sin. I made a mistake. Uh, God can still redeem from that point onwards. Okay. So look at it with the redeeming. Uh, you know, perspective is what I'm saying. Mm. To continue. 
you know this somebody like this okay so uh, so in this situation where one has married an unbeliever and the husband remains an unbeliever his entire life but the wife is very pious i think uh, the lady is doing her best so god's blessings will be there you can't do anything else right sure uh, ma'am what if you apply the same situation in the children's side instead of the spouse mm -hmm. like suppose like uh, like you said the they both are unbelievers both the husband and wife but the children also are un unbelievers now it's uh, now uh, is it the duty of the so a person who's be, who's a believer to spread on the word of god to the children or not yeah. since the husband or the wife is unbeliever will that be possible or not is my question yeah. so see it it is the it is you know you're using the term responsibility i think so because it's a responsibility of a believer to bring anyone to christ so how much more their own spouse and their own children so it is a responsibility so one needs to pray in line with that and live their life in such a way that uh, the spouse and the children also commit their lives to christ okay fine so we'll close off here because we are out of time and then we will pick it up in the next class francis can you please pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this session. God, thank you for help to understanding personal prayer and prayer for family. God, whatever we study being useful to our daily life, please bless us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you, Francis. Thank you, everyone. So we close off for today and we shall connect next week. Okay, so there's a question by Krishna. If the unbeliever spouse decide to go, what should believer do from that point onwards? Marry someone else or stay as they are? So um, Krishna, uh, one could try to uh, you know work it out as you know Paul has Paul has pointed out here, but um, at some stage, you know, if the unbelieving spouse has made up their mind and they want to leave, there's no more, uh, you know, opportunity for reconciliation. Um, I think uh, from that point, you know, that marriage won't stand. Okay, so it is left to the person. It's their personal choice. They move on from that marriage and they decide whether they want to remain single or they want to remarry. So it's up to them. I hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, all right, let's close off today's class. Thank you. Thank you.